Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Adam R. Smith, a.k.a. American Scream on Twitter and Reddit and various other forums. Uh, today, I'm going to do a short video on uh, what's going on in the mainstream media. On occasion, some things happen. I feel compelled to kind of comment. A lot of times, these are little things that slip through the cracks and stuff like that. And also just generally amusing stuff about the craziness that's going on in the crypto industry. So today we have... Um, Something really interesting, uh, Bloomberg, which has been quite pro-crypto since the very beginning, and you know, a good bit of their programming is dedicated to hyping crypto, um, they had somebody on their show recently, which really was a bit of a 180 from their normal guests that are just basically shilling, shilling, shilling. Um, but before we get to that, let's, let's show the lead into that, which is uh, a little short clip from somebody named Kathy Wood, who is uh, involved in a uh, crypto-related ETF, and she has a few prognostications that I really want to unpack. So let's just jump right in, and um, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. Bitcoin's hash rate is at an all-time high, and that is a real indication of the security of the network. Uh, on Ethereum, we're... So Bitcoin's hash rate is at an all-time high, and that's an indication of the security of the network. This really doesn't have a whole lot to do with anything important. This is a great example of a red herring. She's kind of, you know, giving us this state of the crypto industry thing. What is the Bitcoin hash rate? That's just, that's the amount of computations that are being wasted to uh, solve these block puzzles so that the next block so this is nothing to be proud of that we are that the the hash rate of bitcoin is the highest it's ever been that basically means we're wasting more energy than we probably ever have operating the bitcoin blockchain again not necessarily a good sign but it's amazing how these people can put a spin on it why is hash rate so important it's a crucial indicator of the blockchain network's strength it's security yeah to some degree because the whole point of uh, blockchain is you have to waste a tremendous amount of energy in order to keep bad actors from um, screwing up blockchain. But when's the last time anybody heard of anybody, any bad actors coming in there screwing up the blockchain? You know, one of the things that Bitcoin people um, claim is that eh, we've never been hacked. We've never been hacked. You know, uh, they all agree. Theoretically, they can be hacked because of this 51% uh, attack, if a majority of the people operating the blockchain decide to do something, they take control of it. Kathy's arguing, since the hash power is so high, it just costs that much more money to try to get it to 51% attack. Again, just blah, 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 blah. This number is big, so that means it's good. Not really, not really at all. So uh, that's her first statement, which really has nothing to do with the health of the network at all. Um, and then she says something about Ethereum, which is another misleading statement. So let's uh, hear what she has to say. Being uh, the total value uh, uh, staked at 24 billion, that is an all time high. Uh, so we think the infrastructure is working beautifully. So staked Ethereum is at an all time high. And this is 100% true. What she's not telling you is the reason why staked Ethereum is at an all time high. The reason why there's so much money tied up into this crypto project is because these people can't get their money out. It's been frozen. So it's so incredibly disingenuous that she's going to say, oh, staked Ethereum is high. It's a sign of the uh, health of the network, you know? So when ETH 2.0 came out, they gave uh, people a chance to stake their Ethereum for this upcoming project that has been pushed on and on and on and on. And everybody that staked their ETH has had it held hostage. Now, some people argue there are ways to get around selling that staked ETH if you want, but basically it's still tied up in the network. You can't remove it until they unlock it. You might be able to pawn your staked ETH off to somebody else who's going to, who's willing to buy it at obviously a pretty significant discount. But basically uh, everybody's uh, crypto is held hostage. And, uh, you know, if you look down here, one of the, uh, the, the cons is uh, withdrawal unavailable. Currently, you cannot withdraw any staked Ethereum until the release of Ethereum 2.0, which may take 12 to 18 months. 
assuming no further delays. Um, it's been delayed over and over and over multiple times. Now they're talking that they may, people may be able to get their money out next year in 2023. But again, they've been saying that and pushing it back. The point here is that if you're going to argue that there's a lot of money tied up in the ETH ecosystem and that's a sign of its strength, then it's disingenuous to not also acknowledge these people are unable to get their money out of it. There is no facility to remove staked ETH from the ecosystem right now. The, at best, if you can find somebody to buy it off of you and then they'll ha hold on to it, they can. So this is one of the problems with these crypto people. They're just... I, 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 can't, I don't know if I could say it's flat out lying, but there's so many omissions in the messages that they're getting across that it's just, uh, it's sad. It's sad and it's almost getting to the point now where it's kind of just criminal, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think you could make these kinds of statements about traditional securities and not get in trouble with the SEC for misrepresenting the risk and what was going on. But they, they seem to be doing it with uh, crypto. So let's move on now to the real meat and the potatoes of what I find. Oh, oh first off, Kat, let's look at Kathy, Kathy Wood's uh, um, portfolio. She's involved in this uh, ARC thing. So let's... Let's see how that looks. Um, how's her fintech uh, innovation fund doing? Look at this. 52-week uh, range, 14 to 45. Look at where it was a year ago. Look at where it is now. So this thing is in the toilet, completely in the toilet. Uh year percent change down 64.79%, almost 65% loss. So if you bought into her crypto technology narrative, you would have lost more than half of your investment by now, more than half of your principal. So, uh, yeah, um, she's got a lot of damage control that she has to do. And... Um, that's why you get these weird, crazy, desperate talking points that don't seem to really make sense. So um, let's move on. Let's move on to something that may be a little bit more um, hopeful, shall we? That was Kathy Wood, CEO of ARK Investment Management, reiterating her faith in crypto assets in the wake of FTX collapse. We also heard a more faithful uh, tone coming from Aaron Brown in our first segment. So let's get the counter argument now. Joining us is crypto skeptic John Reed Stark. He is president of John Reed Stark Consulting and former chief of the SEC Office of Internet Enforcement. So, John, thank you so much for being here. Aaron Brown was of one opinion. I understand that you are of a very different one. What's your reaction to the conversation? conversation we just had. Okay, I'm not sure exactly where to start, Kaylee. Um, so stop the clock here. First of all, the FTX was not regulated. Uh, you know, I worked at the SEC for 20 years, 11 years as chief. I've taught securities regulation at Georgetown Duke Law School for 20 years. I've been in this space for 35 years. I don't know what he's talking about. There's no oversight, no consumer protections, no net capital requirements, no, 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 no was, licensure. He was talking about the uh, FTX exchange and I get it. And Genesis. I mean, they were regulated um, in the Bahamas, they, they FTX, and, <laughs> Genesis and, Ge and Gemini here. They are not regulated. <laughs> They're regulated. They're regulated. Look, look, look. Somebody signed something. Somebody, uh, there's something with the government logo on it. Look, they're regulated. Um, I think these, uh, the, these crypto shills really don't, you know, you wonder why you don't see a lot of people like John Reed Stark on, because this guy knows his stuff. You know, he's not just a talking head. He's got the pedigree in the background. So to argue with him, I like this guy. Well, this is a real breath of fresh air. You'll see what I'm talking about. He doesn't put up with anything from these people trying to make excuses. Regulated. Regulated means audits, inspections, examiners, net capital requirements, all of the things that SEC regulation entails. So they're not regulated. They may have filed something with FinCEN so they could file suspicious activity reports, but they're not regulated. There's no fundamentals to anything that he's talking about. You know, Bitcoin, crypto, it's mathematical computational blather. <laughs> mathematical computational blather. Um, uh, I think this is really... 
the first time I've seen this in any kind of mainstream media, and I hope this guy gets a lot more attention. There's okay, no, well, there's I mean, no the cash flow. There's no nothing. With that. What, what really regulators? Point, right. We have to differentiate between Bitcoin, the blather, digital blather no, we that you're talking about, and the centralized exchange. Right. This is a business. Um, just trading crypto assets. It isn't, FTX isn't Bitcoin or Ether. No, we don't have to differentiate that at all because most people can't have the wallet that holds the crypto that is somehow tied up in a computer, in a popcorn tin, under a blanket, in a bathroom. Everyone like can. So he's making reference to the discovery, I guess, of some of um, either SBF or another crypto guy's uh, crypto was like in some little thing in a tin in the back of a bathroom and uh he is pointing out that this was one of the big exchanges and that's that's where they kept quote the money <laughs> the DOJ literally founded. that's the whole point of bitcoin oh, everyone what? can have a wallet at home tell, with a private okay, key tell me tell me for what it doesn't function well as a currency at all Okay, you can't use it to buy groceries. It's too volatile. I have. It's too risky. It's too well. That's that's your problem. Every and time beer, you do, you have I've to bought spend gas capital with gains. It. I've He's bought gas with it. Beer. Watch what this guy says. Watch how he weasels out of this of mess he got, gets himself into. I've bought video okay. games with it at GameStop. You know, I've used it for a lot okay. of things. Have you paid capital gains every single time that you've bought, bought it? So he bought video games at GameStop with it, right? Mr. Stark says, "Have you paid capital gains?" Um, this is where this is basically have you committed tax fraud or not uh, every time you see used it no no i haven't <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, the guy admits that he's committed tax fraud and then watch how he backpedals uh, now of course you haven't well you should because that's what the the irs would require from you and just got although the i bought it at 800 so and spent it at six so again so now he changes his story he bought it at 800 and he sold it at six, so therefore there would not be a, be a negative capital gain on that. So that's his rationale for, for covering up that he might have committed tax fraud, is to say, oh well, when I when I used it, it was at a loss. All right, so he did that when Bitcoin was uh, six hundred dollars per. How long ago do you think that was? Is that the last time he used Bitcoin? for uh as a payment method because that's got to be years and years ago when bitcoin was six hundred dollars um you know so again this his whole story just reeks of bs and now he's backpedaling because uh he may have just admitted to tax fraud so i wouldn't i would i bought it for eight hundred dollars and i spent it when it was worth about six hundred dollars so i okay, wouldn't have so paid you capital have gains but every single crypto transaction is laden with fees, is risky, comes with all these, these capital gains requirements, and it doesn't function well. And starting in January 2024, those exchanges are going to have to report those transactions on 1099s just like any other broker dealer would. And retailers, if you're trying to buy, you know, a Rolex on 47th Street for more than $10,000, are going to have to report that to the IRS. So there's going to be more transparency and more sunlight on these transactions than ever before. And you're completely leaving out all of the dire externalities okay not just that there's no oversight no net capital no insurance no inspection no nothing protecting you in any way shape or form yeah no nothing protecting you i mean that's the thing there's no literally no real accountability in the entire crypto market and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about ethereum or doge or bitcoin um and that's one of the problems with uh decentralizing um this entire industry is that there's this plausible deniability excuse where you could go oh well that was ethereum or that was ftx it's not the rest of crypto but if you lift the hood up on all these projects you'll find 99 percent of their operational uh system and their dna is all the same so there's very little difference between any of them especially in terms of regulation and oversight sure this stable coin might have been slightly better audited than that stable coin but neither one of those stable coins are anywhere near regulated to the point of a, a real bank but they all pretend to inherit all of the positive attributes people associate with banks even though they don't have any of the oversight you become an unsecured creditor like all of these celsius voyager mm -hmm. um ftx all of them have become 
the dire. FinCEN just reported the other day 1,200 ransomware, 1,241 ransomware payments last year, double the amount of the year before. And I'm an expert on ransomware. It's growing, it's getting worse. $1.2 billion, none of it recovered, no one found. And drug dealing, human sex trafficking, sanctions evasion. Um, nuclear weapons. The GAO came out with a report that said North Korea was. Well, we have so the very sensitive news. Typically, typically for for dollars, that. right? For I mean, what? don't, don't, don't these what? crimes normally happen with U.S. dollars, John? Oh, of course they do. You know, but that's sort of what about at a much higher is scale, a fraud. right? That's right. It happens with fiat too. This is called the two QOK fallacy, or an appeal to hypocrisy, also known as the two wrongs make a right argument and also known as whataboutism. So when you start digging into crypto and the fact that it's, you know, filled with crime and grift, their argument is, well, crime and grift is elsewhere too. Like as if there's nothing that can be done to address that crime and grift are going to be everywhere. But the fact is, is that uh, by design, cryptocurrency is uniquely good for money laundering, fraud, terror, cyber terrorism. Uh, so, and, and you'll see, uh, this, this is the first time I've seen somebody really go after that argument um, uh, in the media. So check it out. At, that kind at, of what about a much higher is scale, exponentially more. And econ- oh, absolutely wrong. If you, that is a flawed and anemic pivot. That's what I teach my law students. What about fiat? What about this? Of course there are problems in fiat. Of course there are. But Bitcoin and crypto have it brought in a crypto crime wave of epic proportions. And for what? We already have digital currency. If, if Bitcoin were around before credit cards and then credit cards came along, that would solve it. There's- That's funny. And that's a really interesting point I haven't heard anybody else bring up. If Bitcoin had been around and then credit cards came out afterwards, credit cards would have one upped Bitcoin. Bitcoin is inferior to credit cards. It's inferior to PayPal. It's inferior to all of these other monetary systems that have been out long before. So it just really doesn't make sense. And so the people that you run into that are still promoting this fall into usually just a couple of categories. One, like what you see here on... um, Bloomberg is uh, people that have a vested interest in hyping this. You know, they are holding bags. They got to convince other people these bags are going to continue to be valuable. The market's still good because they got to sell their bags. And then you have gullible people who just are told this is the future. This is the future. And uh, they don't know any better. But the truth is, and I keep trying to stress this one point, um, even if you're not a financial expert, even if you don't know about technology and cryptography, if somebody's trying to pitch something to you, this kind of technology, you should clearly be able to see what it does better than what we are already using. You shouldn't need to be confused with a bunch of techno babble, but that's what these people do. Um, your intuition is right. You're like, God, this seems like I hear so many stories about people losing money and criminals. Why would I want to use this? That, that hunch, that hunch you have there, that's correct. Now we have one of the most capable, experienced people on the subject matter, this guy, John Reed Stark, who is former head of SEC and also has tremendous, you know, he's a, he's a, a professor, a college professor. Um, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's not just some pundit who uh, has, a, has, you know, some crypto that he needs to dump. So it's nice to hear this. I, 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 I hope we're going to see more of this narrative in the future. There's Cash App, there's PayPal, there's, there's a yeah. million ways, there's Zelle, that you can use this and you get protection. You're not with an unsecured Zelle? What creditor. What protection do you get with Zelle? All sorts of protection. He calls out Zelle, so the other guy thinks he's going to jump in and again discredit him. What protection do you get with Zelle? Uh, um, let's look into this. You call your bank and you say, this transaction they didn't happen. They don't reverse happen. charges. An- they don't reverse charges. You see he says that? Intermarried. John. Oh, absolutely they do. So one of those guys is right and one of those guys is wrong, right? Because one says they don't reverse charges and one of them says they do. Well, well, let's just stop right there and, uh, and take a look, shall we? So let's go to Google and do Zelle fraud scam reverse charges. Understanding fraud and scams. Okay, let's click on that. Let's see what we got. As a consumer, it's important to understand how fraud and scams are defined. Now, it's interesting. This is in the context of Zelle. We're just answering that one question. Zelle defines fraud as one thing. 
if someone gains access to your account and made a payment without your permission and you weren't involved with the transaction, this is fraud. Fraud? You can, can you get your money back? Yes. You see that? So when Zelle defines a fraud, you can get your money back, but they also have a scam. Now, scam is when somebody tricks you or misrepresents and you knowingly send them money. Now, in a scam, according to their services, you may not be eligible to get your payment. Made. Notice it doesn't say you won't get your payment back. It says you may not be eligible. So in this case, straight from the Zelle website, zellepay.com, there it is. So that guy's claim that you uh, can't get your money back is a lie. Here it is right here on their website. And this is a great example of what these people do is they, they'll they make an as, as, you know, assertion, um, but it's, you know, it's peppered in with a whole bunch of other stuff and nobody stops and fact checks it, finds out that they are full of it. So in this case, these people were full of it. Yes, Zelle has more protections than crypto. Nope. Absolutely. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. All of these in intermediaries are critical to the consumer. And forgetting about those intermediaries is absurd. Taking yourself into the wild. It's not the Wild West. It's not anarchy. It's walking dead like apocalyptic free for all. <laughs> I've, I've heard some anti-crypto hyperbole before, but that has to be some of the best. <laughs> walking dead apocalyptic. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, if you really think about it, it is. It's like in order to actually believe that crypto is comparable to all these other payment methods for most people, you really do have to be essentially a zombie. You do. You have no protection whatsoever. OK. And you right. are There's stuck. no FDIC in crypto is, is something we bring up often. That's right. So there is a lack of consumer protection. But at the same time, consumers also suffered for Madoff and Enron. And there's have been so the, a more what about ism, you know. Uh, oh, so Madoff ripped people off, so let us rip people off too. Is that is that the argument you're making? And oh. examples in traditional finance where regulatory Again. regulated entities have also seen episodes in some ways akin. Okay, so here's a cherry picked atypical example of a regulated entity that took people over. Her argument is, I can find one example, so just let this whole unregulated industry do its thing, right? That just makes no freaking sense into this so why do you view Kaylee, the crypto please. ecosystem as, is so entirely different okay first of all of course there have been crimes financial crimes that's what i did for 20 years but again crypto has ushered in a new crime wave because criminals have a way to conduct transactions and conduct money laundering like they've never had before read the doj reports on it the gao reports on it the treasury reports on it okay. all of these reports you can go to my website digitaltrustwatch.com i don't make a penny from any of this not a nickel not a dime I'm just out there telling it like it is, speaking truth to power, because this is absurd. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, he's not, he's not, claims he's not making any money. I mean, obviously he's promoting his consultancy and stuff like that. So indirectly, you know, there's something in it for him, but it's, there's obviously not as clear a conflict of interest between him and say probably all these other talking heads, all of which probably owe their livelihood, if not a sizable chunk of, their uh, equity to hyping the crypto industry. And I'm in the same boat. Um, I'm not, I have not seen one penny from my activism trying to educate people about crypto. I, uh, I, don't, I don't have any bags that I'm trying to pump and dump or anything like that. And uh, it seems like, ironically, th those of us which, who have the least conflict of interest seems to be, seem to be the ones that are the most more easily dismissed. But then again, you know, the money is on the money is where the crypto hype is to think that these kinds of dire externalities should just be ignored as okay. the kind of thing that happens no matter what. Try to pay a ransomware. Try to make a ransomware payment of five million dollars with cash. You can't do it. You can't so John, go to your bank. You talked about how these are unregulated entities. How much fault should be placed on the regulators for not moving quickly enough? in tandem with this industry why do you fault just the technology and the idea of it itself so he's got a really good analogy he pulls up here that i think is worth paying attention to um so she's now going to try to pass the blame to the regulatory agencies although 
that's kind of funny. This is the this is the big hypocrisy of crypto. Crypto starts off with we're special because we don't need because Uncle Sam can't tell us what to do. You don't want big bad government in your in your wallet and in your finance. We're going to bypass all of that. Now she's saying when things go wrong, where was Uncle Sam? Aren't are they the problem? They weren't there. They weren't regulating. It's just comp- so hypocritical. Uh, well, you know, to blame the SEC here would be like Oswald blaming the Secret Service for the, for letting him shoot Kennedy. <laughs> I love that. That is such a great analogy. I mean, the SEC has brought more than 100 actions in the area of crypto, and they have won every single time. Initial coin offerings, crypto lending programs. Yeah, when's the last time you've heard about an ICO? They basically put an end to that whole movement because it violated securities laws. And they're creeping in. You know, the problem is with the crypto industry is that it's, it is decentralized. There's so many little small operations that uh, it's hard to figure out who to go after. And again, a lot of this is driven by consumers too. People argue, how did Bernie Madoff or Charles Ponzi manage to get their scheme to go on so long, even though people were talking about how it didn't make sense and it didn't seem like it was actually a legitimate business model. Why did it take so long for the authorities to finally crack down on them? The reason for that is because if you don't have plaintiffs, if you don't have victims, then you don't have any impetus to really take action. You, you know, the government is not going to going to, you know, go after somebody unless they can prove they've done something wrong. And the main reason they do that is, uh, is via, uh, you know, testimonial for, from people who are, who are victimized. So that's kind of a core point. SAFs, SAFTs, the SEC has won all of those cases every time they bring these cases in. And they're, they're, they, as far as regulation goes, they couldn't have been more outspoken. Both Chairman Jay Clayton and then later on Chairman Gensler have made speech after speech, regulatory pronouncement after another, talking about the perils of crypto. To doing, you know, they, they, they stopped Coinbase from uh, issuing a lending program. Thank goodness, saving billions of dollars. They stopped BlockFi from doing it also. BlockFi paid a penalty of $100 million. Now the SEC is just another creditor for $30 million on BlockFi's list. But they stopped that lending program and they stopped it from happening. Again, making really, really good points. Uh, if you want to blame the, the authorities for not doing enough, Look at what they have done. They have definitely taken steps and they have stopped a lot more people from losing money. But there's so many of these operations out there. And if people aren't coming forward, if people aren't giving them insider information because they need evidence, this is one of the problems with being able to take action against these fraudulent crypto companies is they're, they're structured in such a way that there's, very, there's no transparency, there's no oversight. So you can't even really tell. Even companies like Coinbase, um, which I don't even think they have like a, a official headquarters anymore you know they're they're all kind of just shadowy organizations for the most part some more shadowy than others for sure but at the end of the day coinbase is not regulated like a a mainstream brokerage house or a bank even though they are a public company people seem to not realize that so and, and look at the Bitcoin spot ETF. Imagine if that had been allowed to happen, what it what would go on? So all of these things, the SEC has been very aggressive and they're just a civil agency. Look, mm-hmm. I'm a big time SEC critic. I wrote an op ed piece in the Wall Street Journal criticizing the SEC for some things they've done. I've criticized them for what they do on cyber, but not on crypto. I, I do think DOJ needs to do more. I think that people need to be put in jail. I don't understand. Voyager makes representations that the FDIC has somehow insured the deposits of their customers. The FDIC yep. sends them a letter to stop doing it. Why is no one in jail for that? John, so, thanks so much. I do fault DOJ for that. All right, so there you have it. Um, interesting, huh? Very interesting. We, uh, it's, it's unusual to see somebody that's that outspoken um, really just aggressively taking down most of the other people's arguments. Uh, be interesting to see if he is a regular or he just came on, kicked everybody's butt. Now nobody wants to talk with him anymore because he's, he doesn't give them enough air to, um, inject their gish gallops. So we'll see. But, uh, anyway, I hope everybody tunes in and, uh, and, um, subscribes to the channel and, uh, helps support uh, these efforts. And, uh, thank you.